all, Warren. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Payback is hell. <laughs> Karma. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing Warren Farrell, a man who truly does need no introduction to this group. Um, I could go into a lot of book titles that Warren has written, which most of you are already familiar with. They are available in the back of the room. I can mention that he was named by Financial Times as one of the 100 greatest thinkers in the 20th century. I think in the 21st century, too. Um, yeah. But rather than just go down a very lengthy list of Warren's accomplishments, I want to take this opportunity to talk about what he's meant to me, and I think consequently what he means to the people in this room and to many, many other people. Twenty plus years ago, I was walking around in a mental health industry knowing that there was something wrong with matters between men and women, knowing that there was something wrong with our perception of men and our perception of women, and I could not articulate it. I couldn't put my finger on what the problem was. Um, all I know is that I knew something was deeply wrong. And I went looking for information. I found almost nothing helpful. I found a lot of feminist literature. I found people discussing men's issues in ways that seemed to more compound the problems that I was looking at than to solve them. And then one day, a therapist I know said, hey, have you heard about this book that's come out? It's called The Myth of Male Power. And just in hearing the title, I said, okay. And I was at the, uh, the bookstore that day, and I got it. And finally, for the first time in my life and the first time in my adult work with people with problems and in encountering what I perceived to be all of these issues between men and women that were not being addressed in a way that was helpful and healthy and that could lead to building bridges between men and women, I found Myth of Male Power and it turned my life around. It made me see things differently. And finally, somebody had articulated. And, and for me, that's the brilliance of it. It is, we are all, there's great writers in this room. There's people on ABFM staff. There's people that do videos on YouTube and really speak well to these issues. Can you imagine being back in the early 90s with no support, with only the feminist perspective around you and conceptualizing all this and articulating all those issues on your own. I think it was a masterwork of our times. And um, I think we're very fortunate to have Warren here. Then I got the opportunity to actually meet Warren and to visit him with him in his home and to share a meal with him and to talk with him on a personal level, to hear about his father and to talk about mine. And what I got out of that was that not only was Warren a genius, but in the realm of human emotion, of the heart, he had an impact on me instantly. I've been following his writing for a long time. I've read all of his other books, but nothing compared to spending time with this man, to seeing the loving relationship that he has with his wife, and the love that dominoes from his presence between people. His work has been the one that has led us to a movement that is finally again starting to build bridges between men and women instead of walls. One of the, uh, the things that we've missed in this culture, especially over the last 50 or 60 years, 
is mentoring. It is a, a lost art where skills and maturity and perspective and, and balance about life is passed from one individual to another, frequently between men, between fathers and sons, between men and their apprentices in what they do. We've lost a lot of that in having it in person. And we've become a society without mentoring for the most part. This is why I'm so thankful for the work that Calvin Mann does in mentoring young men. But I also think that we adapt, especially as men, and that we can receive mentoring from their words, which I've received for many years now from Dr. Farrell. Uh, I could go on and on about how I feel about this man, but this is his moment. I, I want you to hear him. So without further ado, I want to introduce you to my friend and to my mentor, Dr. Warren Farrell. Uh, testing, yes. Okay. I actually, this is what I'm going to be sharing with you today is my third draft of this speech, to which my wife can I can testify. And I have I had a really careful analysis of what happened to feminism, and from my own personal experience with it. But I decided I didn't want to focus this on this event at what happened to feminism, where feminism went wrong, and where I was. I thought. Um, in the right movement and how it morphed into a gap being created between equality, which was the original goal of feminism, and politics, and how politics led to exactly the opposite of equality. I had that all drawn out and worked out, and then I said, no, I want to concentrate on where we need to go, what our top issues are. I want to concentrate on why are these issues that I will define, our top ten, if you will, what I believe should be our top ten, why they are important, and what the psychology is behind working with these issues first. So let me work first um, on, the, on the number one, what I think should be the, would potentially be the number one issue that we should work on, and why that's so important to address first. Number one, I believe, should be the boy crisis, and what's happening to our sons. And here's why. When men discuss adult men's issues, men hear weakness. Most men have learned when the going gets tough, the tough get going. Not when the going gets tough, the tough go to a psychologist. When the going gets tough, the, the, tough, the tough write a book about what's wrong. Or they do some wimpy thing like write the myth of male power. <laughs> That's men's reaction to men expressing their pain, their issues, adult men. Women's reactions? When men discuss adult men's issues, women hear whining. Women fall in love with alpha males, not whining males. Women survived based on their ability to find men who protected them, not because women needed prote protection per se, but because women were focused on protecting the children. And when they found a strong man who didn't focus on his issues, but focused on protecting her and being willing to die for her, her children survived. We're here today because of the sacrifices that adult men made and were selected for by women who focused on men who stood up and fought and saved and sacrificed, not men who talked about their issues, who were introspective, who got in touch with their feelings, who got in touch with their fears. Instinctively, traditional women are more interested in firefighters than a man who says, gee, there's a fire. I, I think the cause might be a drought. Uh, the, fire makes me, the fire makes me feel unsafe. Um, it brings out feelings of insecurity from my childhood. <laughs> so then the question becomes, is there hope for men discussing men's issues? 
And the answer is yes, because we have neuroplasticity. We have the ability to change. Um, our, our, we are not stuck in our biology and our heritage. We, the, the, this, the defining characteristic of human beings who succeed is the ability to adapt. And our genetic heritage is in conflict with our genetic future. And that's where we're at at this moment. So let's look at this in relation to boys' issues. Let's look at, th think for a moment, when a woman who is a mom sees her son having problems as opposed to an adult male having problems, women switch from a biological desire to be protected by a man to a biological desire to protect her son. Suddenly, her heart opens up. Toward her son, her biological instinct is to protect, not be protected. So for example, let me take dating. We know how difficult it is to talk about date rape, um, an almost impossible issue to discuss. If, she, if, a, if we discuss this with an adult woman, if, if she hears a man talking about fearing rejection and fearing taking the sexual initiative, her mind switches to all the guys who went too far too fast with her. Her mind switches to the guys who bought her drinks largely to get her to bed. So instead of feeling appreciation for the, pay, the work that they did to buy the drinks, she remembers the manipulation rather than the appreciation. But she can't easily hear the guy's plight because it triggers her own trauma. It triggers her legitimate trauma. As a mom, if she hears her son discuss his fear, but as a mom, if she hears her son discuss his fear of calling a woman he's attracted to, she switches to, to want to protect him from being rejected. Suddenly, she feels his pain. She wants a woman to see her son's value, the son that she's nurtured and brought up and cares for and loves more than anything in the world. She wants, she feels that. And suddenly, when this, a boy's issue is discussed, she can feel what boys go through. That's why I believe the boy crisis and what's happening to boys is both legitimately an extremely substantive issue. The more you understand the boy's crisis, the more terrified you are. So that's the substance. But the biology and psychology of it is what I just mentioned. That's why I choose it as my number one issue. I feel a bit like David Letterman here. Uh, number two. Um, <laughs> children's need for both parents. Notice I didn't say men's rights to children. It is not about men's rights to children. It's about children's, not children's right to both parents, but children's need for both parents. It's about children's need for both parents because both parents, whether it's by nature or by God, for whatever reason, both parents have ch are checks and balances to each other. Moms tend to nurture and protect and listen and care. Dads tend to push and, and create encouragement to try things that are new. And if the child falls in a ski slope, the mom will say, sweetie, anytime you want to give up the, working for the ski team, don't worry. You can do what you want to do. And dad will say, get up and try again. Um, and when, dad, when mom isn't around, what do dads do? They tend to nurture more. When, dad, when, when, mom, when dads aren't around, moms do a little bit more pushing. But as a rule, when mom and dad are both around, the children get the protection they need, the nurturing they need, and they get the encouragement and they push the push that they need. So what do we know about children who do best when they have both parents? When children grow up in non-intact families, 
when I did the research for Father and Child Reunion, I learned that there was only one series of four things that together had to be combined in order for children who grow in not, up in non-intact families, like ch children of divorce or children who are born outside of um, marriage, um, they, to, in order for them to succeed at the level that children do when they grow up in intact families. And those four things are approximately an equal amount of time with mother and father. When either is left out of the, the equation, children suffer. Second, the parents living close enough to each other so that the children don't have to give up friends or activities in order to see the other parent and therefore resent the other parent that in order to see them, they have to give up friends and activities uh, that they are invested in. And then they either undermine themselves and don't get involved in team sports and don't get involved in things that are healthy for their growth, or they don't have friendships that they really feel that they can be at their birthday party and support them in the way they want to be supported, and therefore they don't get supported by those friends in the way they want to be supported. Third, there must be no bad-mouthing between mother or father, mother to father or father to mother that the child can detect. Bad-mouthing does not mean only words, it means body language as well. Fourth, and this is new research, uh, that, couples, that couples that do family counseling uh, after divorce or in non-intact families do much better than couples with the same socioeconomic background that do not do family counseling. Not family counseling, counseling when needed, but family counseling proactively, consistently. When children have significant father involvement, they do better in more than 30 areas, we now know. When I wrote the myth of father and child reunion, I only was able to document 26 areas, but now in the, in the recent research, it's another four areas as well. And they do better in all social areas. And the most amazing social area is we usually think of a mother as more empathetic than a, than a father. That's probably true, but especially toward the child. But children all over the world who have an equal or significant amount of father contact are more likely to be empath empathetic than children who do not. They're also more likely to be assertive without being aggressive. And just a little hint on the empathy issue. One of the reasons they're more likely to be empathetic is not because dads are more empathetic. It's because dads require, by boundary enforcement, the child to think of the dad's needs, the mother's needs, and other people's needs besides itself. Empathy does not beget empathy. Empathy begets the belief that you can be paid attention to and your feelings should be heard. People who are always empathized with often become self-centered. People who, who are required to think of other people in order to win, in order to, if you want to continue the rough housing, you have to think of not poking me in the eye, not pulling me in the hair, not knocking me in the groin in order to get your way. And if you, and if you don't do that, if you don't think of me, there'll be no more roughhousing. And the boundary enforcer dad who says the moment he's kicked or pulled, hair pulled again, immediately transfer, transfers into say, okay, no more roughhousing. And when he follows through with what he says he will do, if, the, if, what he, if what he asks for is not paid attention to, the child learns to think of somebody else besides herself or himself. When the boundaries are not enforced, the child thinks of how to manipulate a better deal. So the child be, prepares to be an excellent lawyer, but nothing else. <laughs> And there are some wonderful human beings who are lawyers, by the way. <laughs> Occasionally I lie. Um, <laughs> no, just joking. Um, number three is the pay gap. Why the pay gap? Because when, when feminists speak about men's men and women, they basically start out with, it's a patriarchal world in which men have made the rules to benefit men at the expense of women. And the proof of that is that when men and women work equally as hard, men have arranged the world so that men get a dollar for each 76 cents that men get, uh, that women get for the same work. And even President Obama says this. And even President, would-be President Romney said this. It's the one thing that Republicans and Democrats both agree on. 
and it's also completely not true. What is true, and what, so when I did the research for the myth of uh, for, um, why men earn more, I began to find that there were a number of things that men and women did differently in the workplace. And I was beginning to find five, six, seven things. The more research I did, it moved up to 10. The more research I did, it moved up to 25 differences between men's and women's decisions in the workplace. And the, not really the workplace, it's their work-life decisions, the way they handle work and life. Now, there's a big difference between men and women, but not in pay. There's a pith, the, the pay gap is not a gap about male versus female. It's a gap about mothers versus fathers. When mothers and fathers are in an intact situation and, the child, and children are born, mothers tend to divide their labor between the work at home and work in the workplace. And they begin to figure out a world of work which is more flexible, that allows them not to commute so far, that allows them to get home earlier, that allows them to take off some time, like um, be a teacher and take off the, a good portion of the summer. And so jobs that are more flexible, jobs that are more fulfilling, jobs that are closer to home, those jobs pay less. The, because what feminists didn't realize is that pay is not about power. Pay, the road to high pay is a toll road. It's taking time away from your family to be at work. It's being willing to be adaptive to the needs of the workplace. If they open up a company in Siberia or in Alaska or Juneau and you don't like cold climate, you want to get further in that company, you move. And, or you work in Alaska, you know, in Alaskan pipelines or um, in oil rigs and you hope to save, uh, or Alaskan fisheries, and you hope to save up enough money when you're a single male to be able to afford a woman, to be afford, able to afford a family. <laughs> pay is about, uh, when we pay for, we learn this at a very early age, we pay to go out on a date with women. The pay that we pay for, for a woman re re uh, reflexively, is our compensation for our inequality. It is our way of saying to a woman, I am not worthy of your company until I put money out for it. If there's no romantic interest, the man doesn't put money out. If there is romantic interest, the man puts money out because he's paying for his inability to be equal to a woman until he compensates for it by paying for it. When I'm paid to speak here, it's because I'm valued. If I'm paid as a consultant or as an expert witness, it's because I'm valued. The more I'm paid, the more I'm valued. And women sensed and felt that when a man took her to a really nice restaurant, she felt valued. And, that, and, she, and so women began to feel that if they weren't, a man didn't pay for a really nice restaurant, maybe they weren't valued as much as somebody valued the woman who was paid to go out to a beautiful restaurant. So pay for men was what we had to do to compensate for our inequality. It's a, pay is not about privilege, it's about a toll road. Pay is about the power we forfeit to get the power of pay. Now, what happens when men and women are not married and, don't have or, and or don't have children, particularly when they don't have children, that's the distinction, mothers versus fathers. When men and women are, are never, have never been married, this is US Bureau labor statistics I'm going to give you right now. When men and women have never been married and never had children, the women earn 17% uh, more than what never married men who have never had children earn, even when you control for a number of years in the workplace, the amount of education and the length of time um, and, and other factors like that. That has been true to a lesser degree, it was 13% in the 1970s. For 44 years, we've had that pay gap, longer than that, between never married men and women who have never had children. Because when women have not been married and never, never had been married and never had children, they tend to focus more on their careers. And when men have never been married and never had children, we tend to focus more on job fulfillment, being the artist, being the writer, being somebody like me that doesn't make a lot of, that doesn't usually make a lot of money by doing that type of thing. That's why we hear words like starving artist. Now, the reason I feel the pay gap needs to be so high on the list 
is because that's the first place where a woman's mind goes to as proof that men really have organized this world in a way as to benefit men at the expense of women. And more importantly, when women find out each of the 25 decisions that leads to higher pay, all 25 behaviors in work life decisions that men and women make, all 25, every one of them, leads to men earning more money and women having a more balanced life. That is, a happier life, usually. And what is the purpose of pay? The purpose of pay is ideally to have a happy life. So if the purpose of pay is to have a happy life and women have more balanced lives, which usually means happier lives, then really men should be learning from women, not women learning from men. But there are women that want to focus on career. My wife loves the work that she does. And, and so when she, and, and the excitement of that. So what women also need to know is what leads to higher pay should they wish to have higher pay? So the pay gap, when you understand it, it doesn't only help people feel better about the way the structure of the, of the workplace is set up. It also helps women know that if pay is their focus, there are 25 specific things that they can do to earn more money. But each of those things comes with trade-offs. You can, if, you, if you're not educated, you can, as a rule, earn more money as a garbage collector than you can earn even as an art historian. But you may or may not wish to get up at 3 in the morning in Michigan and collect garbage. And the people who do that earn more money in relation to the amount of their education. What looking at the pay gap helps us understand is that the, is the underlying definition of power that men have bought falsely, brought fa falsely, or, or adapted falsely. And that definition is feeling obligated they define power as feeling obligated to earn money that often somebody else spends while we die sooner. And if I started a women's empowerment workshop, of which I've conducted many, and if I started that out by saying, I'm going to teach all the women here today how to be more empowered, I'm going to teach you how to feel obligated to earn more money that somebody else spends while you die sooner. <laughs> You know where I would be. <laughs> the fourth issue I'm going to um, prioritize, you're going to be most surprised with, is communication. If I, and that communication is obviously not just a men's issue, it's a men's and women's issue. But the reason it's so important is because every time feminists speak or AVFM speaks, there is a propensity to distort what the other person says and then to argue with the distorted version that the other person never meant to begin with. <laughs> and when Arabs or Israelis speak, it's the same problem. When mothers and fathers and women and men speak, it's the same problem. When the, and when I, when I, I, in 30, 40 years of working with couples, one of the things that I found is that I've never had somebody say to me, Warren, I want a divorce. My partner understands me. <laughs> and I realized if I could put not a diamond ring on somebody, but I could, if I could put inside of my psyche the ability to have compassion for and understand the person who was speaking with me, I would be a, a better husband than I would if I had the biggest diamond in the world to give my wife. The problem with that is while everyone agrees with me, no one has, knows how to do it. Because biologically, when we heard criticism, we feared that there would be an enemy. And in order to survive, our biological response to the criticism had to be to put up defenses. Or better yet, kill the enemy before the enemy kills us. And when we're criticized by our wife or our husband, that's what we want to do. We want to kill them before they kill us. That's functional for survival but exactly the processes that were functional for survival are dysfunctional for love and dysfunctional for intimacy. And so I said before that our genetic heritage is in tension with our genetic future. That's what I mean. We got here by surviving. 
but we need to, but, but what we, so we've raised, we've upped the ante. Now we're not just need to be role mates, we have the potential to be soul mates. And soul mates require the ability to listen to each other, to listen to each other until we say that the, the other person says, I feel completely understood. If I interrupt Liz and say, I understand, what I'm doing is saying, shut up. She has to tell me she feels understood. So how do we do that? We do that if it's biologically, if we're programmed to respond defensively to criticism and we respond more defensively, the more we love somebody because the more we love somebody, the more vulnerable we feel. The more vulnerable we feel, the more likely we are to get angry, not be, not be centered. Angry is just, anger is just vulnerability's mask. We get angry at the people that reject us that we love, not the people that reject somebody that we don't love. A woman calls a guy, a guy and a woman go out at night and the guy does not call back in the morning. If the man, if the woman, if the woman calls the man a jerk for not coming back, you know that she had an interest in him. If she didn't have interest in him, she'd be call it relief that he didn't call back. <laughs> We, when, we, when, we call, when we call people names, when we, when we cut them off like that, it's, it, it's because it hurts less to be rejected by an object than it does to be rejected by a human being. Construction workers call women, uh, whistle at women, they treat women as sex objects because it hurts less to be rejected by somebody that they know is going to reject them. They're not worthy of that beautiful woman walking by the construction site, so they objectify her. When the woman calls a man a jerk, it's because she felt that that man evaluated her as not being, uh, she not being worthy of him. And so if we have such deeply engaged resistance to being able to hear others, especially when they love us, what do we do with that? We do a work, so one of the things that I, what I do with couples, couples in my couples workshops is I've developed a workaround to be able to work around the biological propensity to be able to, to be defensive when you're criticized, to be able to hear people as to associate the criticism with love, an opportunity to be loved. But how do I do that? By creating an altered space. No one can do that in a natural space. You have to meditate yourself into a space where you are receptive to associating being criticized with being loved. That meditation takes at least a 10 to 15 hour training for people to learn how to do. It means separating out the week so you have uh, two hours of the week as a, in caring and sharing mode and 166 other hours in a conflict-free zone. You have to know how to deal with the conflict-free zone when conflict comes up. Those are the types of things that when we work on them for men and for women, we begin to solve domestic violence because domestic violence is not about power. Domestic violence is about a momentary act of power designed for an underlying experience of powerlessness. And so, when we t so the solution to domestic violence is to not have, tell men, give up your power. The solution to domestic violence is, telling, is teaching both sexes how to feel empowered by and how to empower the other gender and their children and their parents. That's why communication is so important. Now I'm going to go from being a nice guy to being a tougher guy. Issue number five, men's studies. 150,000 women a year have, take, men's, take women's studies courses. When you or I contact the media, if they're focused on gender issues, to a large degree, a very high percentage of them have a women's studies background. And so when I am being interviewed by NPR, even if I spend three hours with the associate producer and convince her that there really is legitimacy to the men's issues, she summarizes in bullet points my talk and the, the, her producer says, the guy's crazy. Um, and you are just too weak to see his craziness. You're too weak to see his manipulativeness. And so therefore, um, no, no, um, no go. And so we're up against a huge wall there. 
Now, so what do we do if there's men's studies courses, uh, women's studies courses in virtually every university in the industrialized world, and virtually no men's studies courses that are real men's studies courses, the type of men's studies we're talking about here, just feminist men's studies courses um, in the universities. So I finished a game of tennis some years ago with a guy, um, and uh, we both belong to the same think tank. And when we finished, he said, well, what do you do? And I go, um, uh, tell him about what I do. And he goes, wow, that is fascinating. Um, and I said, well, what do you do? And he says, I'm the president of Northwestern University. And I said, well, I'm, I'm fascinated that you're fascinated by these issues. Uh, people are always fascinated at people that are fascinated with them. <laughs> and, uh, and he said, uh, I said, are you interested in maybe being the first university in the world that brings men's issues into Northwestern University? And his response was, <laughs> and have me fired. And, I said, How, how's that? I think I knew how that was, but he, uh, he said, um, because the feminists would have me up on a stake uh, within hours, um, and this was just at the beginning of social media time, um, and so I said, is, so I reversed the question. I said, is there anything that we could do to bring men's studies to Northwestern University without even a, missing a beat? He said, of course, Sue me. Sue the university. And I said, tell me more. He said, it. <laughs> and he said, if you sued me, I'd have to bring men's studies into the university and I would be a hero because I was avoiding a lawsuit. And I'd be able to say to the feminists, we had to do this in order to be able to, um, to, to not be sued. And if we are sued, we'd end up having to do things like eliminate the women's studies program. So we have a choice. We can either eliminate the women's studies program or bring in... <laughs> or bring in an equal and opposite men's studies program that really is a men's studies program. And, um, and so I said, any other complication? And he said, yes, you have to have standing. And standing means that you have to have somebody at that university who really wants a men's studies program. So part of what we can do if we make men's studies an issue is recruit men and women on college campuses to, to, be, to file for a men's studies program. Maybe they'll succeed and, and just get it. But if they don't succeed and they want it and there's a group of two or three or four men and or women who want a men's studies program that is a legitimate program on the college campus and they don't respond, now we have a Title IX um, issue. Now we have also a potential violation, if it's a state university, a, a violation of equal protection clause of the 14th Amendment. Now we have something to work with, but here's the big issue of men's studies. Once this happens at one university, particularly in states like California or Texas, uh, once it happens at one university, all the universities who are usually comprised of academics, who usually have a great deal of fear, not that much courage, um, are, are, they are going... <laughs> they tend to respond by saying, uh, oh my God, we've got to get our act together. We've got, to, we've, got to, we've got to do this. And so one successful lawsuit at a significant university will have a ripple effect as the coin that um, you're, you created for us has on, the, on that coin a beautiful picture of a ripple effect. It will have a ripple effect on, at every university in this country. That is every university that gets any federal funding, which is about 97% of universities in this country. But what happens in the United States also happens in the entire world, usually. And so this will have one university, one group of three or four students, can have a ripple effect across the entire world. That's why I believe it should be in the top 10 men's issues. Number six is a men's birth control pill. Yes. 
And this is not just because Carnell Smith is here. <laughs> we often heard, I think correctly so, that a woman's pill was probably the single greatest instrument of freedom for women in the 20th century. I would say that's a pretty reasonable assessment. But it's interesting that we have been within, within just a hair's reach of being able to develop a men's pill for more than 30 years. I wrote about this in one of my early books, wrote about it before the, even the myth of male power, about I went around to scientists and found was a men's pill viable and the answer was yes. So I went to the, um, so I went to pharmaceutical companies and said, why are you not doing this? The scientists now have the ability to create a men's birth control pill. Uh, we're not sure that the men really want one or, you know, or that there's much of a market for one. We're not willing to sort of invest in the whole distribution and advertising. And my response is, are you kidding? And, and, the, and the pharmaceutical companies responded, you show me, you know, we haven't received a hundred letters from men in the last decade asking for that. When women want something, women speak up. When men want something, we keep it to ourselves. And then we wonder why pharmaceuticals can't, companies can't hear what men don't say. We need to speak up. That's why a voice for men is one of the most perfect titles and this is one of the most perfect forums to begin that process. Number seven. <laughs> men's health intelligence. In other words, I didn't say men's, notice I didn't say men's mental health, no, men's physical health, but men's health intelligence. We need, the reason we are so unintelligent in terms of health is because every society that survived, survived based on its ability to train its sons to be disposable disposable in work as warriors, disposable in, I'm sorry, disposable in war as warriors, disposable in work as firefighters, as workers on oil rigs and so on, coal miners, and indirectly therefore disposable as dads. Now, if your survival is dependent upon your disposability, that means your disposability keeps you alive as a nation not your, the health of the boy. If you train a boy to be worried about his health, worried about hurting himself, that doesn't lead to a boy who's willing to uh, risk himself, his disposability to go to war. If I'm, if I'm trained to really care about you and love you, and I do go to war, and you die and your blood is splattered all over me, I go into major trauma. If I learn to not care about you, I go into much less trauma. The degree to which men learn to love, the degree to which we learn to think of ourselves, the degree to which we learn to ask for our health, health and help for ourselves, is the degree to which we were hesitant to be disposable. Therefore, we jeopardize the survival of the country. So what was functional for the health of a nation was dysfunctional for the health of a boy. And so that is why we are unwilling to talk about mental health issues. This is why when boys and girls are nine years of age, we commit suicide at exactly the same rate. But as boys learn, get the hormones and the socialization of masculinity, how do we evolve? We evolve by, at the age of 10 to 14, as we get, to, we get the beginnings of masculinity, we commit suicide twice as much as girls. Between the age of 15 and 19, four times as much between the ages of 20 and 25, five times as much. So we, uh, we are, as we learn to, when the going gets tough, the tough get going, 
not when the going gets tough. We have five or six ways to, to express our feelings like Tom Golden talks about, or other ways to directly express our feelings. We don't learn the different modalities that are both comfortable for us as traditional men and comfortable for us as less traditional men to express feelings or to be able to act it out or be able to honor or to be able to do the other things that Tom so articulately talked about yesterday. When we have a nation that hasn't rethought through its disposability propensities for boys, what we have is boys out there saying, girls out there saying, cheerleaders, first and ten, do it again, first and ten, do it again. And what are the, what are the women saying to the guys? They're saying to the guys, first and ten, do it again, risk spinal cord injuries, risk concussions, risk sh uh, shoulders dislocated, and still play. If you have a dislocated shoulder, I remember watching a college game where the, the, the news people were saying, isn't it incredible that Joe with a dislocated shoulder is still tossing the football so accurately? Well, he should be calling the doctor, um, not tossing a football, but we are honoring him for risking further damage to himself. NFL means not for long for a reason because the people who are, are rewarded and are the heroes of women and men uh, all around the world, they are people who don't often live for long, who are often walking around, barely able to walk at the age of 50, um, and the very thing that they were honored for is exactly the thing that they're weakest in. We need to question this. We need to question this at every level of society. We need to question, why is it that men die five years sooner than women when we used to die in 1920, only one year sooner than women? And very few people, A, know that, and B, despite the fact that we die earlier of all 10 leading causes of death, there are seven off federal offices of women's health and zero federal offices of men's health. That is the type of issue that will be, need to be surfaced that is also suable, that is not, men, do not, men, men do not get due process, men do not get equal protection when we don't have equal protection in the very most important area, which is living. Thank you. Okay, that's number seven, number eight is coming up. Um, 2009, President Obama is just elected. I get a phone call, pick up the phone, the woman says, um, <coughs> We heard that, understand that you were on the board of directors of the National Organization for Women for a number of years. President Obama has just formed a White House Council on uh, Women and Girls. We'd like you to be an advisor to the council. We'd like to be? I said, of course. Um, and she says, um, but I said, before you hang up, is it possible perhaps that you could um, do a, um, have a White House Council on men and boys as well? Um, and she says, huh? And I go, uh, <coughs> well, and I explain a few reasons. She said, oh, never thought of that. Uh, interesting. But she said, um, she said, actually, though, I am in charge of filling councils that already exist. I have no authorization to actually create councils on my own. I said, totally understand that. Um, if I created a proposal for a council, would you be open to um, sort of looking at it? And she says, yeah, well, I'd look at it, sure. And I said, would you pass it on to maybe receptive people within the uh, White House? Yeah, I can do that, I can do that. Um, and so I decided that I didn't really want to do that. I wanted to get the top 30 people in the country that I could think of that were authors on boys' issues, that were people who were liberals, people who were conservatives, people who were practitioners like the head of the Boy Scouts, people who um, wrote about these things in a different type of way for a different audience like the head of Men's Health, people like Tom Golden who are practitioner counselors that are, that are actually working on these issues. I got all, four, uh, all these people together and for a period of 18 months, you can imagine when you have libertarians, conservatives, and, and liberals all on one council, what these dialogues were like um, with you know, sometimes 25, 30 people. Um, Tom is shaking his head because he remembers some of these discussions. And, um, but we finally hammered out a, you know, a very significant proposal to create a White House Council on Boys and Men. When we did it, it, got, it basically, long story short, went nowhere. It almost went somewhere many times, but always at the last second 
there was somebody that knocked it out of the, the agenda to actually present it to President Obama. Somebody that five minutes before it was on their agenda, they were going to be seeing President Obama five minutes later. Why do we need a White House counsel on boys and men? Because boys and men are having problems in almost every single area. We're falling behind girls and women educationally, economically. When we fall behind economically and educationally, I don't know a lot of women who are that interested in marrying men in the unemployment lines. And so this affects not only our sons, but also our daughters, also marriages, and therefore um, whether ch children um, grow up in intact or intact families. The reason, one of the most incredible statistics, the reason a few years ago, 53% of women who had children had children without being married is because many of those women could not find men who earned a decent living, and that often translates for many women into, I just don't want to take care of another child. And so when a man doesn't earn decent money, it has an impact not only on the man, not only on the woman, but on the ability of the children to have a father in that child's life and therefore on that, the ability of the boy to see that he has a role model of something, some person who can be respected and can be productive. A boy who looks at a role model of a father that's disowned, that is put down, he is not a boy who has much of, feels he has much of a future. He's a boy that goes adrift. He's a boy that gets lost. He's a boy that has no sense of purpose. And that is what we have today. So the men's, a White House counsel on boys and men has, uh, deals with many issues. Because boys and men are dealing with many issues, and many issues are being dealt with in different departments of the government, it's crucial for our White House to be able to coordinate that. But it's also crucial for our White House not just to be the government as substitute savior. It's also important for the White House to conduct an, inter an interactive relationship with private companies that also do work. And the White House is doing that now with Brothers Keeper and with the White House Council on Women and Girls. But with adult white males, it is doing nothing. That's number eight. And number nine, <coughs> feel this building. This is the building of men who are the ultimate in being willing to be disposable. What we don't know about these men is that recently in the war in Iraq and Afghanistan, for each, 20, for each man who was killed in the war in Iraq and Afghanistan, the number who were killed by suicide is 25. 25 that killed themselves by suicide for each one that died in the war through war-related means. More men die of suicide who have been in the war in Iraq and Iran in one year than, have, than have been, were killed in the wars themselves in all of the years combined. What we are saying from that message is, when we need you, we will use you. But if you happen to survive the process, we don't care. We're willing to invest money to get you the equipment, to buy you the best of this and that. But when you fin you're finished your job of serving, if you haven't died on the outside, we don't care what happens on the inside. And when we don't care what happens on the inside, we are making the ultimate statement about the continued investment that we have in male disposability in the cruelest of ways. The good news is that if we make veterans care a major issue, conservatives can understand that. Traditional men can understand that. And almost all men and women can understand that. And we give our sons a message that if you do join the military, you will be cared for as a human being, not just as a human doing. Number 10, and last, 
men's image. Boys are stupid, throw rocks at them. It could be made up by anybody. But when it was made up, it was started out as a postcard, then it became a t-shirt, then it became a hat, then it became an industry. I don't have any problem with anything really terrible being said by anybody. I don't have a problem with Hitler. I have a problem with the people that agreed with him. Because, that's, because it takes more, if no one agreed with Hitler, then there would not be um, any, there would not be any Hitler as we know Hitler. When somebody produces terrible words, I don't have a problem with it. I have a problem with the atmosphere of the country supporting those words so that it takes those words and translates that into an industry. I have a problem with the Dallas Rapid Transit, the dart that you heard here the other day, yesterday. I have a problem with them having a picture of a boy saying, when I grow up, I will kill my wife. Or a black girl saying, when I grow up, my husband will kill me. And I have a problem with the fact that we don't understand why that picture on the dart poster was a picture of a white boy. Because if a black boy was saying, when I grow up, I will kill my wife, we would immediately understand, see, explain, and be really infuriated at the racism. Because over the last 30 or 40 years, we're not free from racism, but at least we've got, begun to recognize it at, on that level of obnoxiousness. But a white boy, when he says it, we did not see the sexism. We didn't see the sexism to the degree that the, that the, that the poster was funded, that the poster went through the city council, it went through public employees, that people posted on, posted it on the, uh, on the, on the, um, buses, and until there were complaints from a voice for men, it wasn't taken down. That tells you the embedded sexism in this country. That tells you the degree to which there is an image problem for, for boys and for men that we need to address. The good news about men's image as an, uh, as an image problem is that I find that as I go through a lot of things, aside from boys' issues, that after boys' issues, people are able to look at that dark poster, look at the um, men are stupid, throw rocks at them. They can see that Jews are greedy, throw rocks at them. Blacks are stupid, throw rocks at them. Women are stupid, throw rocks at them. They can see the sexism in that pretty quickly. And that gets them on board to a common desire to have some justice, to have some compassion, to have some caring. And we need to bring that common desire aboard. All of this translates into the issues that I have discussed. When those issues are dealt with, they will deal, they will take care of solving problems of issues I haven't discussed. When we deal with communication issues, we will deal with a lot of the problems that lead to date rape and sexual harassment. When we deal with communication issues, we will deal with a lot of the problems that lead to domestic violence out of people not feeling heard. So let's look at our names. A Voice for Men is a great name because people understand that men have not spoken up. People understand that women can't hear what men don't say. People understand that the shadow side of masculinity is the lack of a voice, lack of expressing feelings. I think it would also be helpful to have subsections called a voice for boys and a voice for dads and a voice for women who care about a voice for men, boys, and dads. <laughs> Let's look at the term men's rights activist. Here is the challenge of men's rights activists. You know and I know that men do need rights. We need the right to equal parenting. We need the right to not be registered, the only gender registering for the draft. We need the right to men's studies. We recognize that all of these lack of rights are total violations of the 14th Amendment and often of due process. But men's rights is a tougher than necessary fight in a world that believes that men made the rules and have all the rights to begin with. It's like asking for king's rights. That's the first challenge that comes to us. So we call ourselves a men's rights activist 
the average person, particularly the average liberal, and you know, is going, Egh. and the average conservative is going, men don't complain. And so it's like we're back to the thing that I mentioned at the beginning. It taps into the biological resistance. It's a salmon swimming upstream. We have so many valid issues, we don't need to start by swimming upstream. We need a little help down a good hill to get us going. I think a better way of framing ourselves is men's issues activist. Jim. And, and, to, um, and, and we've called this a men's issues conference. And so we are, we're on the road to that. Uh, Jim in my workshop the other day um, said that men's issues activists had also the advantage of being MIA and men's issues are definitely missing in action. <laughs> or we can call ourselves more genetically, generically an advocate for boys and men's liberation becoming part of a gender liberation movement. And then that helps people to see what's been left out. Very few people can argue that gender means two genders. And there hasn't been a boys and men's liberation movement. Something's missing. It's easier for people to join the fight for what's needed for, than for the fight for what appears we already have. In the final analysis, we don't need a women's movement blaming men. We don't need a men's movement And we don't need a men's movement either fearful or blaming women. We need an understanding that in, throughout all of history, both sexes had roles, both sexes had obligations, both sexes had responsibilities, neither sex had rights. The job of our mother and dad were exactly, was exactly the same. They wanted their children to have lives that were better than theirs, and they would sacrifice their lives, whether it was a Chinese intern laborer building our railroad or some uh, going into the military. They sacrificed their lives with the hope that what? Their children's lives would be better than their lives. Mothers and dads are in the same boat. We care. We love each other. We love our children. This is not a time for a men's rights or a women's rights movement. It is a time for a gender liberation movement, helping roles go from the rigid roles of the past to more flexible and fluid roles that recognize the individuality of all of us individually in the future. Thank you. That was a spectacular presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. Farrell.